Yeah, so um, hello, everybody. I mean, it's hard to get feedback right now, but I think you're all around and uh, we can start with the talk and with this first um, Phoebe at home and um, with Ted Davis, who is kind enough to be with us today. And uh, yeah, we're just, uh, yeah, I think without further ado, we should just start right away. Yeah. Okay. Hey, Fabian, thank you so much. And Phoebe. Uh, my dear, for the invitation. Oop. Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Great. Thank you for the invitation, Fabian. Um, yeah, I will walk you through four main projects uh, and just sort of show you uh, sort of my take in creative coding, interaction design. And I welcome questions in the middle of it. So I guess if there's some questions that happen, maybe they'll get passed to the chat. And I'll try and keep an eye on it and react in the moment. Otherwise, we can also ask them at the end. So I thought I would start with an old project, uh, Glitch, because it's great seeing it used in the invitations for, for this event. Uh, this was my master thesis that I did a little over 10 years ago, now actually 11 years ago. And it was here in Basel at the Basel School of Design. And I was really curious, what is a digital image? Like what is making a digital image different than an analog image? And I thought it was so strange that our tools were making all these references to analog aspects like in dark rooms or canvases. And I started wondering like, what exactly is digital about that image? We're treating them so similar. And so I had tried just a random experiment of dragging and dropping the image over text edit and saw these weird um, data sort of just suddenly appear and started doing weird experiments of just deleting stuff and switching ones for twos. And I didn't know what to call this while I was working on it. So I called it text edit remixes until I later learned about the term glitch. And I was using Che's image because there had been posters in Basel that were showing his image and saying, it's a revolution. We give you internet with a cell phone subscription. And so I was curious about appropriation and what is a digital image and started just discovering this under the surface quality to our digital images. At the time, it was more most likely that you would uh, be able to sense something was digital from some pixel artifacts. If you emailed it at low res or the wrong file was attached in print. And I started thinking about this as like an opacity versus transparency of the medium. If we think of a window, when the window is perfectly clear, you see the landscape outside of it. And the minute it's cracked or dirty, all of a sudden it says, hey, there's a window, this medium sitting there. I thought it was really interesting that as humans, we tend to focus on the surface of an image, uh, but have the ability to look at the structure, like the ones and zeros underneath it. Whereas the computer focused entirely on the structure, maybe a little bit of surface information like pixels, and now it's totally changing through machine learning, deep learning. Uh, we're getting to the computer is learning to see the surface so much like we do. So there's this interesting balance of the topper inside of the data files. I <clears throat> just found it really interesting that the computer is seen all of our different media as the exact same language. Like to it, an image is the same language as a text file, as a movie file. They're all just ones and zeros. And so I started doing these experiments of putting text inside of a picture and was doing it with things like MySpace profiles versus the text or pictures of president's speeches and then adding that to their portrait to see what would happen and eventually got to a really reduced, uh, just checking what happened if I put one letter inside of a picture. And so the main tool that came out of that research um, about the top of an image is called header, is called text to image. And basically what it's doing is it's taking the head of a JPEG image and keeping it and saying, this is a JPEG image, it's this big, this color profile. And then anything that you type in becomes the body of the picture. And so it lets you completely replace what the contents of a JPEG image are with text. And it opened up, it was uh, one of the first tools that I made sort of in an interactive way. I learned PHP and got way more into web 
uh, skills beyond the simple websites I knew how to make. And it was huge that I could put it out there and get tons of inputs from people around the world who would type in totally different languages, totally different ideas and inputs in search of that weird translation of an image to a text. And it made me uh, start to question, like, is this what a JPEG would like to look like if we didn't make it be a picture of our food or our family? Like, is this what JPEG really is underneath? I've had the benefit that since uh, 2012, I've been teaching once a year in Basel, a glitch course where we learn this process of breaking down JPEG images and then going and searching out. Everyone searches for their own file format to explore and try to become an expert of it and see how to, to make it tick. And so the last couple of years I was focusing on typography and glitch, and I'll just show two projects from students that had played in this domain. Uh, one was exploring <clears throat> a scanner function on their printer and what happens when you manipulate that scan. So it's sort of scanner glitching an analog like process and stretching typography called the Bon HP DeskJet, the name of the printer. And it sort of introduces a whole different way of, of creating type. I mean, scanner art or Xerox art isn't um, something so new, but then it's interesting to take those and re-vectorize them and build a font out of it. Another example that had come out of it was exploring a brand new format since only a few years, this high efficiency image compression uh, that Apple and a few other companies have really adopted as techniques to, to pass images around at a much smaller size. And it's such an interesting entropy process, uh, like a waterfall that you make a little bit of a glitch and then everything after it uh, tumbles. And so they uh, explored melting glaciers as a theme and took these pictures of glaciers and, and saw the pixels melt. Changing up, uh, Basil.js, a project that uh, began with a bachelor student who wanted to do a, a thesis project on the Martian Chronicles, and they were really interested to program in InDesign and try to visualize what it might look like uh, through strange conversations and type. And nobody at our institute knew how to program in InDesign. A colleague, Ludwig Zeller, had uh, learned about the diploma project that Julia Laub and Benedict Gross had done in Schwiebisch Gemund and invited Benedict Gross to come give a workshop in Basel. And while he was preparing for the workshop, he realized just how much code was necessary in trying to give a workshop uh, just to make a rectangle appear. And so he started checking out processingjs.org and saw there was some interesting uh, links between processing code, going to JavaScript that could then go into Adobe's Extend Script Toolkit, which is based in JavaScript where it lets you write in JavaScript for all the Adobe software. And so in 2013, we launched Bazel uh, 1.0, Bazel standing for bringing automation and scripting into layout. And it's a library that you attach and allows you to write uh, inspired by processing. So we have a lot of the functions that processing and P5 as well has. The link is getting really close between P5 and Bazel now because of it being both JavaScript. And it becomes this really interesting hybrid between uh, maybe programming from scratch on a multi-page document and you have such great type control in InDesign, or you can create things first inside of InDesign and apply scripts to them, kind of like you could do back in Flash Action, action Script. Uh, so here's an example of having taken an uh, example script from processing. It fills with circles, circle packing on the page. And then the nice thing is like in processing or so, you'd maybe finish a script and then export it as a PDF or so and go work on it somewhere else. But because we're in InDesign, you can keep playing with the things that are created on the page or start to manipulate type. I'll show you a couple recent student projects 
that have explored this. Uh, this was a project from master students that was based on a data set collected in Milan around the time of the World Expo. They had created, uh, they found a lot of buildings and sites that were abandoned or emptied uh, as an architectural collective. And they thought, why did they build this whole new complex for the World Expo? They could have really enlightened the city, uh, bringing these places up, renovating them. And so they had this huge data set where they had gone on uh, Google Earth and like or maps and made polygons around the buildings and they had the geo coordinates and took photos. And with Basil JS, they could go through that data and go grab aerial shots of from Earth um, of these buildings from Google Earth. They could grab all the details they had stored. They could lay out the photographs that they'd collected and sort of bring this data set into a book story form. Another example is Animal Farm. Master students created, and it started off with uh, sort of telling the story and using some maybe expected visual uh, data visualization characters, circle maps, uh, bar charts, scatter plots, and then started to play with uh, the abilities that we have in InDesign to do weird things to typography. We can break things down per line, per word, per character, and started to map different sets of data to, to those characters. So this was about access to safe water. This was about working hours, different countries. This was about censorship, and sort of trying to show those visualizations over text. Uh, it's always fun to see a debug view of what's happening while the script is running. Usually it's sped up. Uh, you can see the clock in the upper corner just because it's, it's not the fastest environment being in InDesign, uh, but it brings us all these neat possibilities that aren't as interactive, but multi-page especially. And so this was plotting out um, taxi cabs in Manhattan over New Year's Eve and just exploring different uh, techniques to look through that data in the aesthetic and items that we have at our hands in InDesign. This was taking advantage of that ability to adjust things per character and taking descriptions of what it's like to have dyslexia and have trouble following a line of text and sort of tried to visualize some of these descriptions that they had been given and did a whole series of different ways of manipulating the type and then fed them back to friends who had dyslexia and were able to find some interesting degrees to which one could manipulate the text and actually help the reading of it to sort of give it a certain structure, uh, which we've also seen across in, in certain font design to give um, something easier to, to hold on to while reading from left to right. This is, uh, we're really going to test the streaming speed of this connection. This is a time lapse of uh, my first year Green Login Introduction to Interaction course, uh, where we're usually covering Bazel.js and, and P5.js, previously processing. And this was about using data from our media tech about what books are there and sort of using an API uh, hooked up to data and, and sort of making a book about books and yeah, exploring what happens, um, trying to visualize data over multi-pages, because that's one of the the really big things of using the Spatial JS is hooking up to all these different APIs that are out there on the internet, newspaper feeds, weather feeds, joke feeds, and um, bringing that into a published form. You can do some really weird things in Basil JS as well. This was during a workshop about generative magazine covers and the student wanted to make a scream magazine. So it was all about uh, maybe when you picked up the magazine, you'd have to scream and the loudness of it would determine what the design was on the inside. And so we found a pretty nice workflow. We had this experimental mode that's looping, kind of like processing or P5 would, and could use processing to analyze the microphone, constantly save a text file, and then have InDesign, Bazel.js constantly read that value of your, your microphone and manipulate the text. We've built a couple games 
um, in InDesign. So there's a whole niche just waiting to be exploited of giving designers fun games to play inside of InDesign. And coming soon, uh, it's been a number of years in the making. It's 2.0 for Bazel JS. It's been, um, yeah, just an ongoing. We've had these great collaborations, collaborators joining the project. And we have all kinds of really interesting features happening. I think uh, this is demonstrating points and Beziers um, are going to be really easy to access. You can do some weird manipulated type on pages. One of the biggest things that's being added, if anyone has used Bazel.js, is getting rid of this B dot. And this was something that sort of protected us from running into problems uh, with Adobe's own functions. It was sort of like a safe way to, to not run into to issues and figured out a way to scope it. And so now we can get rid of this B dot, which means the code is really similar to P5.js. If you're familiar with this, it's like the processing inspired JavaScript using HTML5 Canvas in the browser. And so it's really interesting to use the two environments parallel and sort of sketch really fast in the browser with P5, bring it to InDesign with Bazel.js, manipulate type, play with multi-pages, or you could design a book with some code and then go make a website that's borrowing some of that code to make interactive visuals. Uh, yeah, this is a uh, shout out for a 2.0 release. Uh, the new features list is now longer than when I took this last screen grab. And so there's all kinds of development. It's been years in the making. Hopefully we make it out this 2020. Hopefully spring um, will keep you posted when that's out there. There's already a development version on GitHub. So if you are interested, I recommend just uh, jump to GitHub and we have it pretty well documented all of the new features. So you can already start playing with it. You don't have to wait. For something completely different, I want to introduce XYScope. Um, this is part of a lineage of tools and experiments that sort of grew out of slowly becoming maybe dissatisfied with the amazing monitors that we have on these laptops. So right now I'm really happy that it's possible to, to like do this stream and see people in the stream and uh, collaborate so well. This like in looking at photos, we have these retina displays, which are great. But at the same time, it's the machine that we're using as a web browser, as our email, and now as our meetings. And when you're doing creative coding, at a certain point, I got a bit tired of seeing my code output always on that same screen, that same kind of display. And so it kind of all started exploring what code looked like outside of the display. About 10 years ago, when I was able to buy an old pen plotter, like an old HP draft master, and started to learn how to talk to it with serial connection. And that introduced like uh, what I like to call new and newer media which is using even newer media to talk to older new media. It used to be new and now it's, it's, it's still new media. It's always new media, but we have even newer media to talk to it. And so this was uh, one of the explorations looking into thermal printers. It was really fun to use these for photo booths. And once during our open house, taking advantage of eight floors that we have in our staircase and just running a long roll of thermal paper there by default, 70, 80 meters long, and could just tape it off in a little repeating band. And then it got really interesting when people came by, took a photo, and overprinted themselves, because eventually it gets so full that you get these really interesting overlappings and unexpected moments occur that look so much different in an output form than they would on the screen. Yeah, so next to pen plotters and thermal printers, um, I got to experience some really nice laser projection works from Robert Henke, both this and Lumiere, um, a four screen display. And I could not believe the power of a laser and sort of that quality of light that it provided in contrast to a video projection. And so I revisited a project that I've been doing that I'd been doing with the first year bachelors when teaching them processing. I was typically 
showing them how to use typography and then manipulate it with audio to do sort of audio reactive type. Um, to try and encourage people that are interested in doing image or type as a focus to also consider interaction and, and sort of say you can play with both of those things and take them in some other direction with interaction. And so this was the first year that I taught this course using processing and audio. And then I was interested to try and bring laser into that. And so I made this sort of mock-up of what this might be and, and sort of made a 3D cube and thought, the laser is awesome. It has this really bright light, but it's limited because it's a single beam. It's physically moving little mirrors back and forth, the Galvo motors, and drawing with a single beam. So you can't do too complex imagery, but it's so bright. So what would it be like to combine video projection and projectors over one another? Uh, so I went to a forum and asked and, and learned about some software that was uh, thousands of dollars. Uh, and a lot of people interested in doing it, but hadn't had time or, um, yeah, I, I was lucky that around the same time I was looking, there were already some open source tools making it easy to talk to these devices. So there was a ability to talk with open frameworks uh, to one of these interfaces to a laser. The way you talk to it is ILDA is the interface. And I got a laser and a projector and put them next to each other and made some really crude experiments at the beginning, sort of testing what that mapping could be like, sending shapes from processing and sending the commands for the laser from processing to open frameworks. Realize less is more, of course, and just doing like smaller graphics, it really depends on speed trying to have the two aligned quite well, you could get some really interesting, um, just sort of almost neon-like qualities to appear. And made a sort of faux library because the class was about teaching processing, it wasn't yet going into open frameworks. And so sort of recreated things like lines and circles, ellipses and rectangles, where you could just put an X in front of it and then it would use OSC, open sound control, to send it to open frameworks, which would control the laser. And that became laser letters, which I'll play a little bit of. And uh, with this type music project, it was great that there were 25 students in class and I would be 26. And so we could map out the keyboard perfectly and that became our interactive input that we have a wireless keyboard that floats around the room and whoever wanted to could play VJ just by typing on the keyboard. And so it was a, a project to figure out like what, what shapes do you take out of your more complex drawing and put to the laser? Because you can't put too much, otherwise it freaks out and you can hear it sort of squealing as it tries to move the mirrors too fast. And you had to decide, yeah, which, which part you wanted to light up. But some really neat things happen when, yeah, it, it's like what do you take advantage of? There was an example of having sort of a, a fade leftover inside of processing where the laser had been, leaving a trail. There's an example, I believe it's on R, that we start to get a really 3D shape just from drawing actually quite a bit of points and the laser kind of rounding it out on us. A little bit quicker, this video is online, you can check it out later. Yeah, this is interesting, this sort of three-dimensional quality that happens from it bending. The whole alphabet. Okay. So parallel to this, while checking out the laser had been uh, slowly becoming more and more obsessed with an oscilloscope, uh, which is a similar idea of a vector display that it's also just a single beam moving around. Um, whoops. And I started to see them on YouTube, uh, some different really neat videos, the U-scope, a demo video from the demo scene, uh, where a teenager had figured out how to control the X and Y of this, this um, CRT, the, the screen, 
and could control it entirely. There was how to draw mushrooms. There was a quake port. And so I got a cheap one on eBay and hooked it up to a keyboard and just kind of tried a little bit. And it became sort of a slowly over the years trying to figure out how can I control this thing? How can I get my graphics, which are already mostly vector coming out of processing, onto this kind of display? Uh, one of the first tools that I made to control it was for processing. Uh, my partner was working on our PhD and was exploring abstract animation from the 40s and 50s, uh, where they had used oscilloscopes to make um, pre-computer animations. And they were mainly using these patterns. And it was sort of a question like, what were those patterns? Uh, what kind of signal frequency generators were they using to create them? And so I created a tool called Lise de Joux, uh, which lets you just kind of intuitively move the mouse left and right for your, your left and right signal and sort of find what these relationships might be. Because on the oscilloscope, what's really interesting is um, if you can hear it a little bit, and I'll turn off the audio. With the, within the oscilloscope, it has two channels coming into it. Uh, what is my next thing? Here is an example. This might be a little, hopefully that's not too harsh on people's ears. Uh, you have two signals coming into an oscilloscope, which is normally used to sort of compare and repair like a radio or TV or some electronic device to compare these, these maybe two different uh, electric electronic signals coming in. But it can be anything with energy coming into it. So you can use an adapter and send music into it and see what it looks like. And slowly, finally, um, through conversation with, with what I was doing wrong with uh, Jules van Rosen, learn that sort of basic secret that uh, what was necessary is that any kind of movement that went left to right on your vector drawing had to be plotted to the left channel of audio that's being sent to the oscilloscope. Any vertical changes had to be plotted to the right channel uh, to, be, to be seen. And so once I did that, I could finally change some of my code and, and it would work. I could just convert any of my drawings into these wavetables, which are basically an oscillator uh, and, and draw anything from processing. And so I was copy pasting, copy pasting code from, from one sketch to another and sort of trying to keep up these functions I'd sort of created for that laser project and was slowly rebuilding all the primitive shapes from ellipse and rect and line and point and complex shapes and having them instead of drawing straight to the canvas, convert them to sound so that I could get it on the scope. And then because it's an audio signal, it's really interesting to plug that signal into uh, different audio effects like playing with reverb or chorus or cutoff just to see what effect that has on the, the image the sound and the image. And eventually realized after copy pasting code over and over and over, I should probably make a library, which I hadn't made before. And so that was a fun learning process for processing to, to finally be able to contribute back to this whole library ecosystem, um, which is so nice that people have made things for physics, for type, for all of these different functions and created XY scope, a function uh, specifically for vector displays and laser and a few other vector displays. So this is the teaser video. If you hook it up to a scope, you get a fun little Easter egg while you watch it, which was kind of necessary because I screwed up while recording the audio while trying to capture the screen. Uh, that's the honest answer, but it's also fun being able to have an Easter egg that what you hear is different than what you see. And so when it first launched, it uh, came with examples like drawing or using your connect, which is really nice for isolating the body. And then with this, I'm using OpenCV to convert it to a path and then those paths to the lines on the, or to the sound. A webcam, which then later became a siphon. Where do you get an oscilloscope from? That's the question. Um, eBay eBay or Ricardo here in Switzerland, um, they are not that expensive. They're around 50 or so euros plus shipping. 
which isn't too expensive. Um, it helps to have a delivery service right over the border in Basel to be able to open up German eBay. And it's a, it's a risk when you buy it. It's really helpful to see one that has uh, pictures of the image so you know the beam is working. Hopefully they show a picture of the beam sharp because yeah, they can be quite dangerous to open up or very dangerous to open up if you don't know what you're doing. So it really helps to get one that's, that's functioning. And they're constantly on eBay and Ricardo because they're just sometimes being replaced by digital ones or a lab closes or um, they're available. So in XY scope, I wanted to keep it as easy as possible where a beginner knows these are the primitive shapes. You just have point, line, rect, ellipse, begin, shape. And once you've attached the library, you really just have to put XY dot in front of it. Once you initialize, I'm going to use this library and you say, clear my waves and build my waves, it's as easy as just putting X, Y in front of things. So it's really um, quick to combine it with other libraries that are out there that are doing weird physics things um, and, and send these to the scope. There's some other really great tools out there. A quick shout out to those uh, for Max MSP, Peer Data, Blender, using microcontrollers. Uh, there's a handful of, of, of options out there, and I really went the processing route just because I had been using processing so much and teach with processing and found um, it to be my environment of choice. Last, no, two falls ago, we, a whole group of us gathered, uh, a niche audience, and there was Vector Hack, and this was a teaser that I made for like a bunch of people made different teasers for it. This was a teaser for XY scope being presented there. And it just wanted to show it for two things. One, you can hopefully hear a little bit of the audio, which is interesting that we can send the oscilloscope at any, we can send our sound at any frequency because it's just a, cu a custom oscillator with a wavetable. And so you can hook it up to a MIDI keyboard and, and like play music with images. And what's happening here is additive synthesis. So there's the type being sent. And at the same time, uh, other waves are being sent, like different kinds of um, different waves, sine waves, square waves at different frequencies. And those two end up sort of modulating each other and create these forms that you would never think of making or I wouldn't know how to do in other software. That's only possible because I'm mixing this audio transmissions. Uh, this was the first installation. Oop, it paused. Strange. Let's try it again. Is it going to play? Good. Um, this was the first installation I made with XY Scope. This was taking the data set from Google Quick Draw, which is this game where you sort of are asked to draw a shoe or a toothbrush and AI tries to, a trained AI tries to recognize that drawing. And after, I think it was six months, they gave out 50 million drawings that they had collected from people for 300 something objects. And so this was in a display window right in front of a hamburger restaurant here in Basel. And I thought it'd be fun to let people sit there, eat hamburgers, and watch people around the world draw hamburgers. So on each display, you could watch slowly the, the reanimation of these hamburgers that came from everywhere. And then when one finished, it would go up to this thermal printer, kind of like in the back of the kitchen, and show you that drawing along with where in the world it was created. And installations that I did afterwards, I started playing with the data where it showed you the drawings that were not recognized, which was really interesting because there's maybe 200,000 recognized hamburgers and then maybe 2,000 not hamburgers. And it became really interesting to see like what is not an image to an AI. So I use things like a UFO and a mermaid and a dragon and an angel uh, just because we don't have photographic proof of what those look like. And the AI said, nope, that's not one of those things. Something that people are constantly asking is, can you make the screen bigger? Can you like hook up an HDMI to the back of it? No, you can't because it's the CRT, this cathode ray tube that's sitting and sending electrons from the back of it with uh, usually electrostatic or um, electromagnetic deflection steering that beam as it comes to, this, to the surface, the phosphorescent surface. 
and glows. And what's really interesting is just seeing how people will sort of uh, approach this smaller display and have an intimate moment with this glowing screen. It's something quite different than a projection. This was one installation exploring this aspect of what happens when we combine different signals. So there was an invitation from Taipo Jonji in Seoul, South Korea, and the theme was body. So it was about mixing type and body somehow. And I thought it'd be interesting to use this connect, which captures your body and take type and somehow mix those two signals. So this is documentation of it shown in Iverk in Freiburg. And what happens is you walk up to the piece and it's constantly with a connect capturing a two second buffer of your, your outline, your body. And the minute you walk away from that first display, it shows your body again, but it's doing this additive synthesis of mixing letters on top of it. So it goes through the alphabet and here it's an S, now it's a T, and the T is at a way higher frequency. I think it's, um, it could be it's something like a thousand or, or more at a small volume. So it kind of just modulates on top of the lower carrier signal. And here was the opposite. The type is at a lower frequency, it becomes the dominant frequency and the connect loop is then added to it at a really high soft frequency. And then it was always interesting to put this last screen which just shows you the buffer that's constantly being captured and so it lets you sit here and watch people interacting with the first station or sit there and watch this moment of yourself uh, repeat, repeat and just sort of that translation of your body into this completely different form. This computer here. Along the lines of how to make it bigger, uh, people are always asking, like, can we make this as nice, but can it be bigger? Uh, quite a few people have approached this old video game system, the Vectrex, which was unfortunately a commercial failure, but an amazing system uh, that was a vector display video game system. You put a color overlay on top of it, it had a white screen, and through a plastic overlay, you had a color screen. And there are guides on the internet to walk you safely through opening it up and intercepting the X, Y, and Z of this monitor. Luckily, it's, it's quite an easy hack. You just have to really carefully discharge the TV and follow very careful instructions. And then you have control over this image. Uh, it has a built-in video game. And then there's also a mod to, to disable this sort of spot killer. So if there's nothing in the center of the image, it, it still forces the image to appear. And it brings you to about a nine inch screen display and a really interesting quality of line. It has this, this white kind of spaghetti like line. And at this gathering of vector hack, uh, a lot of us joined with oscilloscopes and vectrexes and some people with lasers. And we, a lot of us were reminded of the, the size and scale and dangerousness of a laser. And so then once we got back from this event, a lot of us went and wanted to, uh, to add laser capabilities to our different libraries. And so uh, figured out a way to, the laser is accepting an analog signal. And so this was a way that you could use your nice um, audio uh, deck, your digital analog converter, turn it into this ILDA signal, and then send that to the laser. And so the last version about a year ago released XY scope with laser capability. And that opens up all kinds of other interesting possibilities. Oops. This is the sound that's being sent to the laser. And then what's really interesting is being able to play with RGB now. So you also can send shapes. You can send weird frequencies. They can be in sync with the X, Y, like the main drawing, or they're in a different frequency, and then you get colors kind of passing around through the shapes, doing all kinds of weird things. The, a new version of X, Y scope is on the way. I've just embedded the Hershey font um, set, so there's type built into it, and I'm slowly, constantly trying to improve the, the way in which it draws the forms, and so there's a new way that's now making shapes even less connected to each other. Because normally, if you really want disconnected shapes, you use a scope that has a Z axis, which controls the brightness. 
but then it's really nice if you can move the beam around quick enough to avoid these lines and only need two signals. Last but not least, I'm going to do a technical switch and show you one last project. And then I'm really happy if there are some questions people would like to ask. Let me switch to uh, Live and switch my sharing to P5 Live. Okay, share. Hopefully everyone can now see uh, this screen from Chrome. So, hello, Phoebe. Um, what is P5 Live? I'll walk you through just a little bit of how it came to be and, and what it is. Awesome, thanks for the signal. Uh, last year in Basel, together with some former students, we organized the Processing Community Day. And maybe, hopefully, some of you out there came and, and enjoyed our program. We had talks in the morning, workshops in the afternoon, going into P5 and processing and Basel.js. And then we wanted to have a party in the evening. And because we were hanging out the whole day, dealing with processing and creative coding, thought it'd be really fun to have an algo rave and, and be able to code live visuals. Because the sort of paradigm of coding that most of us are used to is you code for a while, you hit run, then you see your code, you realize what you should change, you close the window, change some code, hit run. And it can be sort of a disconnected process of like, thinking by text, seeing what happened, reflecting back. And so decided it, uh, it was a thought between processing and P5, what to use, and decided to go with P5 because it's so much easier to build a web app compared to some kind of a native app. And um, yeah, and the editor is a fantastic tool that I really enjoy for sharing code and like being able to put a sketch there, add assets, save it, and then pass a URL to someone else and they can see what's happening. Uh, but one of the issues for making visuals was that it's a side-by-side -side paradigm. You have your code on the left and output on the right. And in this domain that was, was slowly learning about, slowly experiencing of algo raves, this whole notion of having live coding, uh, primarily in sound and more and more in visuals, was this idea of having full screen visuals with the code overlaid and wanted to try and make a tool in that direction. Uh, until then, I experienced Cyro, which was a really interesting open frameworks project, had its own programming language and let you have some presets and, and make really quickly boxes and loops and VJ with code. And I had recently become aware of Hydra. Let's load even another background. Hydra Editor is a fantastic video synthesizer, visual synthesizer, modular inside of the browser. And so it was really inspiring to see, okay, in JavaScript with the canvas full screen, we can get uh, these things happening in real time. So basically what I had done was the very first half of it was just taking a text area, making it full screen, taking the P5.js, which runs in a canvas of HTML5, making it full screen in the background, and just saying, anytime I make a change, try to take that change and process it in the canvas and slowly learned I needed to use iframes and it just slowly became more and more complex. You, then I switched to um, Ace Editor, a fancy syntax uh, text editor. And basically what we're seeing now is a sketch running, kind of a meta sketch running. And this is the code for it sitting on top of it. And I can toggle the code on and off and I'll go through and change some things, like I'll give it some uh, random color, uh, typo, random color. And now we see it's like made those changes. The minute I lift my fingers, uh, it, it waits half a second or you can adjust it, that it tries to compile the code. And so you can make all kinds of changes, random 255, we could have just random shades of gray in there. Uh, there's all kinds of things in here. It started out as just this really simple little tool to say like, hey, let's just be able to make some sketches and save the sketches and export the sketches. And then it slowly realized, okay, we should really have folders and put folders inside of folders. And then you eventually get 
hundreds of sketches in here and now there's a filtering searching option so i could go search for p5 stuff and go find those and all kinds of settings in the until just a few weeks ago if you were on a pc i killed your copy because i was using control c to turn on and off the cursor uh, but now you can do shortcuts and sort of customize uh, the whole thing, turn on and off line numbers, oops, when the code is visible. But one of the big things uh, that, that P5 offers, uh, besides sort of reacting to audio, let me quickly do something like that and take our, our sketch and just demonstrate. I've added snippets so I can press a command key and now it is, oh, it's the same to Soundflower for later. Let me quickly change my input device to this microphone and see, good, it's using my microphone now. Uh, there are snippets so that I can just sort of quickly make code audio reactive because the idea of this was to be for visuals. And so now I'm using my microphone immediately to change these letters or I could ease it so it's like a nice smooth transition. Uh, let me start with a new. But one of the big things I wanted to add to P5 Live, because we're on the internet, we're in our browsers, we've gotten so used to things like Google Docs or Etherpad to collaborate with one another, I thought it'd be really interesting to try and bring that to this coding, uh, which when I was searching for this, most of the systems I could find were kind of about testing people in code. It was like you'd have a test, you would code, and someone would watch you code for maybe a job application. Um, but I thought it'd be really neat if we could just creative code and make visuals together in the same space. So what that is, is co-coding, and I'm going to start it up. It's booting up the server. The, the server is running Socket.io and WebSockets on Glitch. Uh, dot com. Let me see what happened. That lock just killed it. Let me try one more time now that the server is up and running. Okay. I'm going to lock it. Uh, I'm going to show you this URL. You should probably be able to see it there. I'll copy it into the chat on the, on the Zoom. And if you can see it out there, feel free to come and hang out in here. All right. We have our first user, second user. And what this is, is it a playground to code with one another. And so ooh, we'll see how many people pop in here. Initially, I thought it would be fun with just like two people that you could sit there and sort of like have uh, communication with each other, talking with comments. So I'm going to say like, hey there. And hopefully everyone that's in there sees that happen. What I quickly realized, uh, it would be really fun to teach with this inside of classes and like have a whole group, like my class, 25 people hanging out in there, we could demonstrate some things together and play, and therefore I had to create lockdown. So right now it's on lockdown. One person figured out how to wave their hand and say, let me edit, but I don't know who you are. I don't trust these random letters. So you can click on your name at the top and give it a custom name and cursor color if you want. Set, okay, ah, I see a name there. Okay, I'll let you edit. And when I put my mouse over here, I can see where people are hanging out. But by default, it's off because otherwise it might be a little crazy. So I'm going to add an ellipse, mouse Y, 100. And I'll, hey, you said hi. Hi. <laughs> okay, I'm going to take away your, your ability. Sorry for a minute. Um, I'll add one other. And you should be able to move your mouse around. If it didn't compile for you, you can press Control, Enter and that recompiles the code. Control E shows and hides your code. So I can see it's there. Let me just quickly add, can do a print line. Hello, yep, and we have a console down in the bottom that you could probably see. Uh, let me give this thing a fill of random shades of gray, or turn that off. And I'm going to disable the editing for a minute. And sorry, sorry. Um, something that I wanted to show you is inside of P5 Live, we also have soft compile, I call it, because sometimes you draw without a background. Like I'll add a background. 
and then I just see my circle. But if I turn off the background, then I get to trace and like make really fun images just by by leaving it alone. Um, and soft compile is basically I can change numbers. I'll go down to fifty. And what I do is I only update the draw. I like replace the draw on the fly with your new code. And that enables you to do really interesting manipulations while things are happening without having to rerun the entire code. So what I want to demonstrate as well, if I go fill 255, and I'll go maybe down to 100 for 50. Um, there's one other cool feature in co-coding is broadcasting. And the idea of this was my mouse is totally different than your mouse. So anyone who's in this room is sort of drawing themselves and I can turn on broadcast. And now I control the X, Y mouse. So I can also clear it on everyone. And I can say, hello. And hopefully this is working on your screens as well. We're getting a nice little divot of lag in there. And this is something kind of uh, interesting to explore. Like, what does it mean to have multiple of these windows up in different parts of the world? And maybe one of the screens is actually controlling the code. The other ones are just displaying or hiding the code and seeing the changes. So I'm going to disable the broadcast. I'm going to unlock the room. We have 20 people in there. And just let chaos unfold for just a minute. The link again, I will pass here in the Zoom. It's interesting to open up the room and let anybody type and see how quickly bugs happen or what kind of weird stuff happens or leaving uh, messages. A box is being created, but then that means we should go in WebGL mode. If we want to play with boxes there, now we have a box. The coordinate system changes a bit, so... I'm going to say this minus width divided by two, minus height divided by two. Uh oh, we have a triangle drawing outside of our draw. This could be a problem of some of the syncing with too many people, or it's really dangerous to press undo. So I would recommend not pressing undo in a co-code. Loops are also an interesting, dangerous territory. If we create an infinite loop, you could kill the room. So don't do that. But I mean, uh, it doesn't compile a loop if you're sitting on this for section. Yeah. So this is co-coding. Uh, P5 Live, you can import and export all your sketches. Just I can, I can save steps of what we've been doing together with cloning. And I really recommend if you play with P5 Live, do some VJ visuals, sketching live really fast. Uh, make sure you export all your sketches all the time because everything that we do, all of my sketches, this is just like a reset version of it. It only lives in the local storage of your browser. Uh, nothing's on the cloud. And so you have to constantly back up your sketches and then you can always import them. And it's also a nice way that you can use different browsers or you can work offline. In the about section, there's the whole manual. No one's going to read. Uh, but at the very bottom of it, there is info running an offline server, and you can do it really quick and easy with Python. Just download the P5 Live, start up a server, and you're offline without internet. Or you could use Node, NPM, and then you can do things like use Open Sound Control, OSC, and interact with um, musicians making music locally with you. Or you could do co-coding offline on a local network. Yeah, we've got some interesting not compiled code, uh, making a loop, printing lines. I think it's because we have an int, uh, which here we're in JavaScript, so we've got to use let or var. So we had an x. I can make this a global x and say let x be 0. There we go. We're back and alive. And I'll clone this and play with it later. Uh, I think I'm going to exit the code code. People can hang out in there still. I'm going to exit and say thank you for uh, your attention, for hanging out in this talk. And I'm happy if you have any questions that you'd like to ask.
you can either ask in the Zoom or um, pass it to YouTube and, and grab it there. I see a question in the chat. Have I tried porting XY scope stuff to work with a line based CRT like old TV? I have not, but um, yeah, that would be interesting. There are people who are doing lots of line scanning is like rescanning is another technique uh, where you're constantly moving the beam left to right and playing with the Z axis to, to do things. And maybe it's interesting playing there. You can also, when you really know what you're doing, you can modify a TV uh, to become an XY monitor in the, the super dangerous, have to be really careful what you're doing, but you can control uh, the beam. And as a TV, you would still have a certain kind of resolution. And then when you go to the next level, people can rewind the yolks and really become a, a vector monitor. Um, yeah. I saw someone unmuted their mic. Was there a question there? Maybe. Um, I would have a question. Sure. Like, so you went away from, from basically pixel screens, like any other screens you want to like conquer or like, All like the other screens. forms of screens, <laughs> I don't know, like your, your dream screen? Yeah, good question. Um, I mean, there's, yeah, there's so many types of screens and I think it's good and bad how much time we've spent on our laptop screens. Like, as much as I crap talk seeing some of my code on there and going to other ones, then I'm also really excited to come back and, and live code and, and use it on this thing. But it's also interesting live coding to other devices. I'm slowly trying to figure out getting XY scope in JavaScript or something so I could live code that display. Uh, but there's so many interesting screens out there. E-Ink, uh, the magnetic flipping guys, the... Yeah, I've always been fascinated by all these mechanical screen technologies. Um, and then it's interesting, what, what things do they offer? Maybe lower res, but work totally unplugged. It will still stay on. Or the frame rate, I've been hearing from people who have been exploring e-ink, uh, what kind of frame rate you get there. But then there's interesting glitches that can happen if you don't refresh the whole screen, but only certain pixels at a time. And so all the screens, I'm interested in them all, but I am, I'm pacing myself uh, based on, I think for a really long time, I wanted to play with LED screens <clears throat> because those are so, such a bright technology, um, but really low res. So it's also interesting using those limitations. How do I get things uh, which I created with Bazel.js to a website? Good question. Uh, Bazel.js is in InDesign. And so you are basically just creating an InDesign, but with 2.0, if you've already started using that, the B dot is gone. And so you can take your code, bring it to P5. You'll have to turn off Bazel only functions like the typography stuff. And we have a handful of functions that are unique to InDesign. You'll have to disable some of those things uh, or find like the P5 equivalent, but you can do quite a bit of it. It's like not a, it's not completely one-to-one. -one. Um, it's easier the other way around to go from P5 into Bazel.js because like the type and all that stuff doesn't exist and then you get to add it. Uh, you could also use Bazel.js to export PDFs and PNGs and bring those to the website. It depends if it's like a vector graphic that you're creating or is it interactive that you're wanting. Thank you. Could, yeah. Could you imagine working with glitches in the physical world somehow? Let's say 3D printing, something comparable. There's an awesome example in Basel at the House for Elektronische Kunst made by media group Bitnik uh, who got to glitch the facade. Um, I'm always in awe of physical glitches because uh, it's such a digital thing to me that like we're playing with data of these digital artifacts. Um, but it's really interesting when you bring it to physical. So there they got to take the facade, they took a picture of it, did a JPEG glitch, worked with architects to, to manipulate the building and match that JPEG. Uh, in previous classes with students, they have played with 3D printer, sometimes manipulating OBJ files and then 3D printing them, sometimes manipulating the, the 3D print itself. 
Um, all of this falls under that sort of glitch slash embracing errors, like just finding where an error could happen and then exploiting it. I haven't done enough of it myself. Maybe with pen plotters, I've explored glitches happening. Um, yeah, but I would be interested to play with that more. I think there's a lot of potential. Other question. Um, I have, I have uh, a second question. Mm -hmm. Do you know uh, free JS? Yeah. And what are your experience? Uh, what are your experience with it? Almost none, but I'm totally impressed every time I check out the example page. Okay. Um, yeah, it's it's a super interesting environment. When I was first making P5 Live. I was hesitating over if I wanted to call it P5 Live or some other, like everything live, and let you be able to pull down and use different libraries to like live code uh, 3.js or D3 or uh, Paper.js, or there's, there's all these other really interesting libraries. And then I slowly realized um, all the bug correction, all these features were getting more and more specific to P5 slash P5 is such a fast library to sketch in. Like I can make crazy 3D things with about four lines of code or three lines of code. I could make a teapot do crazy things. And I know in 3JS, it would take quite a few more lines. I'd be able to do way fancier reflection and textures and manipulation to it. Um, but I, I really wanted this to be like a really fast, sketchy environment. There are live coding tools out there for 3JS. Uh, Nick Bruce has made one that I know of. And potentially, you could do anything like that in P5 Live. Potentially. I have a thing where you could say, let libs equal an array. And here, I can load any JavaScript I want. So I can load remote um, CDN hosted libraries. I'm doing that sometimes if I'm online. When you run the offline, uh, let me fire up, check if my offline is, ver is running, not yet. I guess it, it might be only this one tab. Let me go localhost, test, test. Okay. Um, and let me search for a library like Veronoi. See if this guy's still working. Um, I might have moved the, the scripts around. Oh, no, there it is. So this is like, if you can see my webcam. Uh, and at the top, loading a handful of really interesting libraries that I learned from Kyle McDonald's using the face and P5. Um, so I never done the test myself, but I could really imagine it's possible to, to combine 3JS or any other library, loading it at the top. I don't know, but I would think so. You might have to figure out how to link it into the P5 uh, canvas. Okay, cool. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have a question. Uh -huh. So I'm used to working with processing and Arduino sensors. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to experiment a bit now with AI tools. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering, like, because you said processing is your preferred programming environment as well. Mm -hmm. um, maybe which tools do you recommend to start with AI? Or are there even compatible tools with processing? Yeah. Um, yeah, my time is totally getting split between processing and P5 now. Like once I started live coding here, I started getting super impatient to like run and typing in code really specific in Java and then pressing play. Uh, but it's still so powerful. It's like got the speed and libraries that, that are really awesome. For playing with AI, I'm not doing a lot of it, but I, maybe you've already checked out Runway ML. Nope. Okay, I would definitely check this out. It's a, it's a platform for artists and designers to sort of quickly play with machine learning. And there you can load models um, that are out there without having to get like super deep in Python and whatnot. And you can run a little web server and you can have it like be, it can send images and text back and forth between different environments. So it, they have a bunch of setup for doing it in the browser but I'm sure there's a really nice workflows between processing too, where it runs in the background and is like 
somehow analyzing what you're doing, going through a model and giving you feedback. Nice, thank you. Yeah. We need something happening on here. Uh, what should happen, Basel logo. So are there any more questions? Else, um, we said we would later continue with uh, some music from Andreas Pittler and he would try to make some nice visuals to that. Yeah. And um, then we set up on our website like these little opera rooms where we can maybe talk with each other a bit more. And you can also, well, we can't offer you beer or hot dogs, sadly, at mm -hmm. this TV. But uh, on the website, you can download and print them yourself. <laughs> um, uh, just now, any more questions or else? I think we could continue to that. Yeah, thanks everyone for listening in. And I encourage you in these times of remoteness, co-code. <laughs> Set up a date with someone else and just like see what that's like. It's, it helps to have just one or two other people in there and see what happens when you code together remotely. Yeah, thank you a lot. Um, usually we would now give you like a nice bottle of wine and some chocolate. I'll but, go grab uh, a beer at the end. Yeah, we, yeah, me too later. But uh, instead of doing that, we decided to, to like donate like that amount we would pay for uh, by a bottle of wine and some chocolates to we'll see what. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Thanks for, for initiating that and setting that up. Yeah, I hope we can do some more of these. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. <laughs> cool. Now I'm going to go grab myself a drink for the Apro yeah, and too. I'll see you all in a bit uh, in the live coding DJ setup. Looking forward to that. Cool. See you. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Aber ja, wie lange geht es, bis du so einen Screen gekauft hast? Nicht lang. Nein, ich weiß nicht. <lacht> schon geil. Schon geil. Hure geil. Also, wo geht die Party ab? Wo <lacht> geht die Party ab? Auf der Website, on the Website. We now have these wo rooms and the there you can join a party room. Yeah, but there are so many rooms. Are we so yeah, many people? I don't know. I don't even know if there are people in these rooms, honestly. <lacht> But it would be fun. Okay, right, bye. Thank you. Hello?
Thank you. 